Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge uh, John Hopkins University for funding the C4D economic study. The cardiovascular patient outcomes research team trial randomly assigned patients to undergo non-primary PCI, either at a hospital without on-site cardiac surgery, or to be transferred to a site with uh, surgical backup. The co-primary endpoints for this trial were tested for a non-inferiority, and at six weeks there was found to be no difference in mortality, and at nine months no difference in major ad adverse cardiac events for patients randomized to be treated at sites with or without on-site cardiac surgery. However, there were some important differences in resource use. First of all, patients at the surgical site had to be transferred. Therefore, they had more staged PCI procedures. But during the, during the nine-month follow period, they had fewer target vessel and total revascularizations. Secondly, since in essence they, uh, this, this site was bringing up 60 new interventional programs, there was a requirement in the protocol that sites without surgical backup had to use the intensive care unit for their post-PCI care. So we conducted an economic study to compare medical resource use and medical cost differences for patients at sites with and without surgical backup. Our study included most of the patients in the C4D clinical study. Primary endpoint was total costs at nine months. Second endpoints were admissions, lengths of stay, and medical costs at different time intervals. And we did include a subgroup sub analysis by uh, uh, annual PCI volume, which I'm not going to show in, the, uh, in this morning's presentation. Study period ran from the diagnostic cath at the site without surgical backup through nine months. And our primary costing method was to collect bills for all the patients enrolled in the study. That was done by the coordinators at the sites uh, under the management of Duke Economics and Quality of Life Coordinating Center. We used uh, ratios of cost to charge, uh, Medicare ratios of cost to charge, to then estimate hospital costs, and then standard methods of, of using uh, resources on CRFs and Medicare reimbursements to estimate physician and ambulance costs. So the, uh, the patients enrolled in this trial were, were similar in both treatment arms. Uh, of note, there were 73% elective procedures in both arms. The number of emergent procedures was about 3%, which is also about the same number of ST elevation MIs. And importantly, about 60% of the patients were either non-ST elevation MI or unstable angina patients. Differences in resource use were largely driven, driven by differences in the protocol. And so outside of the, of the few crossover patients, the typical patient in the surgical arm underwent a diagnostic catheterization at the site without on-site cardiac surgery and then was transferred to a second site with uh, backup surgery for their PCI procedure. For patients in the other treatment arm, most of them, 94%, received a diagnostic cath and PCI in the same uh, hospital stay although some required multiple admissions for the PCI and the procedure, and some of the stage procedures required multiple ad admissions for that. During the follow-up period, there were significant differences in revascularizations, emergency department visits, and at the end of nine months, the people in the site in the, uh, randomized to uh, uh, PCI sites with surgical backup had about 2.8 admissions, where there were only two admissions for people in the sites without surgical backup. So with this as a background, with the, uh, and I'm not showing now, but there are also significant differences in length of stay. Surprisingly, we found no difference in index procedure costs for patients randomized to have their uh, procedure at sites with and without surgical backup. Because of the, of, the law, of the difference in revascularization rates, we did find a difference in follow-up period costs favoring sites uh, with surgical backup. And at the end of the nine-month follow-up period, there was about a uh, $1,500 difference favoring uh, the, these sites with surgical backup. And so we conducted a second analysis trying to determine why there was no difference in index procedure costs for these two groups of patients. And here I, I'm showing costs broken down by cost center, and this is for the index procedure only. We've got non-ICU rooms, ICU rooms, and cardiac procedure is really just cath lab plus implants and then other costs. And you can see here that the decision to require sites without uh, uh, surgical backup to send their patients to the ICU for post-procedure care had a dramatic effect upon this study's outcomes. So even though the sites without surgical backup had shorter lengths of stay, they had larger uh, uh, ICU room costs, higher total room costs. And we're showing here also a non-significant difference in, uh, in, in per cardiac procedure costs 
and these were not related to differences in implant costs, but were totally in the cath lab. And so we're currently looking at whether differences in volume were, were causing this difference in cath lab costs. In conclusion, we found that patients receiving PCI at sites with versus without on-site cardiac surgery had greater resource use, longer lengths of stay, but slightly lower medical costs at nine months. And the higher costs, uh, medical costs for patients at sites without on-site cardiac surgery were attributable, first of all, to the decision in the protocol to use the ICU for post-PCI care, and secondly, to slightly higher rates of subsequent uh, revascularizations at sites without on-site cardiac surgery. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Eisenstein. Uh, let me just frame the flow here for you so that you understand the sequence. Uh, when the program committee uh, decided in July how to put together these late-breaking clinical trial sessions, we were very impressed with the opportunity to have not only the science presented in late-breaking clinical trial session one and then uh, following that in late-breaking clinical trial session two, the health economic implications for some of the studies that were presented in late-breaking clinical trial session one. And we also took a creative step here and decided to have the health economic implications of many of these things that we're discussing today presented one after another and then have two discussants, one focusing on the clinical implications and one focusing on the economic implications. So we're going to follow that flow here, and so we're going to hear uh, next from Dr. Dan Mark, who is going to uh, discuss the quality of life outcomes in the TACT study. Thank you, Elliot. expected the slides that are up are probably not the current version of what I've got, but will be, there will be some minor adjustments uh, for those who come to the afternoon session. The slide shows my disclosures. Um, I'm privileged on behalf of the TACT uh, research team and the TACT investigators to present the quality of life outcomes of the trial to assess chelation therapy. TACT, as you've already heard, was supported uh, completely by the NHLBI and NCAM. Uh, 